Gesu Seaton. I'm the CEO of DeFi Trends. I'm also a data scientist, hence being on a panel about data. Uh, what we do at DeFi Trends is break barriers to investing in crypto and simplify data-backed investment decisions. And I'm here with Chris Poulin, who's also our advisor at DeFi Trends. Yeah. Good to meet everybody. And so Chris Poulin, I'm CTO of Singularity DAO. And Singularity DAO, we're a full service DeFi that uh, does everything from staking to uh, launch pad to that sort of thing. And then we our flagship product is called Dynasets, which is a fully serviced crypto hedge fund, which will obviously be incredibly regulated, uh, as we heard from the earlier panel. But uh, that's a different story. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about data in decentralization and as we're producing staggering amounts of data, is the decentralization a good way of solving this problem? So what do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, I think that in terms of having a talk with you guys, it's important to emphasize that when you're new to crypto, that not everything is decentralized, right? Some things are centralized, some things are old school leveraging of Web 2.0 assets. So if you are building a website that people are accessing, that's a standard centralized server that someone's accessing. Uh, the decentralized part is the blockchain part, classically, right? And so in that particular way, it's important for those of you that are new to crypto technology to understand that there are hybrids of of things going on, and it's not just sort of like everything's on the blockchain or everything is classic web. For those of you that are, you know, lifers, old timers in the space, I think it's important for you guys to understand that you need to push the boundaries of understanding that, that some places in Web 2.0, it was done well. Mm -hmm. Obviously with the big tech companies, it was not done well but in some places it has been done well. So I would look at those case studies and I would try to you know, uh, be wise about that data governance model. And then in terms of decentralization, you know, keep pushing the boundaries of what you can and cannot do in terms of decentralization. Yeah, definitely. And for example, on our platform, we have both components of Web 2 and Web 3. When we're querying information over Twitter, Telegram, Instagram, Reddit, uh, we essentially have some of it on our central servers. And then for blockchain data, we're actually getting it um, on our decentralized servers. So it's applied for both ways. But I want to give a little bit of a history of data and why it's essentially important. We've come from uh, taking data on census to the emergence of big data in the 1990s, and that centralized servers are essentially Yes, they're good in some cases, like you said, but they're not optimal for the amounts of data that we are getting. And it's a shortcoming in centralized servers like Facebook and Google that are essentially owning our data, and it's more susceptible to um, censoring for governments. When it shuts down, you're going to lose all your data, and we don't want to lose our data. And Web3 essentially solves that problem. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the key is how do you leverage the best of what's out there? And what's frustrating for me, being in IT, AI specifically for 20 years, uh, is just that there are good case studies that you can see. There are good case studies you can find for data governance. It doesn't have to be the sort of dystopian world that we find ourselves in. You can actually do things better. So what do I mean by that specifically? I'm saying that if you're building like a decentralized social network, you could do it in a way that's, that's smart. It, it's uh, so often you find that the implementation is lazy. It's not that, it's not that there's not an answer out there. We're, we're, overloaded with white papers and, and best practices on how to do things. Um, but decentralization, if done intelligently, uh, is an amazing opportunity. And, I, and, and so ideologically, I would say that let's not let that opportunity go by. 
Definitely. I actually today saw this post of uh, a drawing of a horse, and the first one was like white paper development and product, and through the drawing of the horse, it was like a nice drawn horse this way, and it was going, and then it was like a stick figure, because that's one of the shortcomings. We find that a lot of these new applications that are on Web3 are a little clunky, and so we need to do two things, and one is have better UI, get to you make it more operable, easy to use, and then we'll have mass amounts of people using it. And secondly, and the most important is education. What is the benefits of Web3? Why do we need to use it? If we all start using Web3, then we're definitely going to um, do it. And at what we do at DeFi Trends and how to use the analytics is we go through education and we do earn to learn, for example, and we teach people, hey, what are the benefits of using Web3? How can we simplify it that the whole public can use it? Then we can integrate into Web3 way easily. Yeah, and I think there's another thing in terms of usability, which is that, uh, and Mark Cuban talked about it this morning with, with you know, if you're DAO, if you're a DAO, for instance, and you're voting on you know, the color of scarves versus, versus something impactful, uh, that's, an, that, that's an example of an opportunity, right? That, that your user interface mm -hmm. is not just your user, I mean, and, and I'm not taking away from UX design, but I'm saying <laughs> that your user experience yeah. is also inclusive of community in a way that is incentivizing good behavior, but also incentivizing participation because they, have, they actually have an effect on what the network does for behavior, right? I mean, this is... If you read the, the, the bylines and, and the, the backstory on a lot of the Facebook politics, really the investors are, are, are not happy with the fact that, that, they're, that even their voice is not heard in terms of how the network is governed, right? So if you can actually navigate that, um, I think it's important. And I will say that you know, the, the one shill comment I will make is that yes, uh, at Singularity Dow we take the community very seriously, but in that, in that vein, I, if, if any of you are into the DAO governance, you know, auto, automatic DAO governance uh, electoral process, you know, definitely reach out to me because I, I'm interested in automating that and, and automati automating the incentivization process as much as possible. Uh, and I know that, that we have that in common. Yeah, we're doing similar things. We use a lot of data, and data is the future. And I actually wanted to talk about the benefits of data. Without having staggering amounts of data, we cannot have the optimal product, the optimal service. We cannot train our beautiful machine learning models. We can't do uh, artificial intelligence without having that data, and we want to bring it to the people, but simplifying it, like I said, bringing it back to simplicity and for the masses to use it, because without our users, then what are we essentially doing? So what are your thoughts about uh, the benefits or the shortcomings of Web 2 versus Web 3? So, you know, kind of tying it all together, I would say that, that Web 2 still does some things better. Mm -hmm. Web 3 does some things better. I think that it, it again, it behooves us to figure out which, which is which. Uh, also, it, it tying in what I said about DAOs, I think that that's yeah. an opportunity to disambiguate from corporate interests versus the network's interest. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that that's, um, that's kind of my opinion on... Uh, best practices on both. Yeah, and we deserve to own our data and not be used as a product. And I actually am um, friends with Brittany Kayser, who runs the Own Your Data Foundation, teaching people about uh, how we can protect ourselves and data governance and all the policies that we need to know about because we're being kind of sold uh, Facebook is free, Instagram is free, but you, you know, you know that essentially your data is being used against you, especially for ads being targeted. Well, sometimes I like the ads, and it's nice to know it's optimized for that, but it's uh, some of the shortcomings of it. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, the this goes back to Jaron Lanier and people that talked about sort of how you own your data and how you participate in ad networks and how you participate in commercial 
uh, interests. And so building those systems where you have the opt-in. So when I ran a DOD program, we were all obsessed about opt-in and applying a clinical model outside of clinical modalities. So you apply a clinical model of do no harm, get participation, get opt-in, you know, really build your networks that way. And so we were constantly pushing that at the DOD saying, hey, it's not, a, it's not a healthcare application, but maybe you should look at it like you're a healthcare professional and you should try to apply those standards to those networks so that you're actually doing no harm and long term people don't come back and say, hey, your network hurt me in XYZ way. So I think that's another way to, to participate without uh, opting out. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And it's, I love the topic of data storage and the differences between that and Web 2 versus Web 3. In um, traditionally Web 2 applications, we're using HTTP protocols that are based on location, whereas in Web 3, we are, um, it's based on content, where the content is, and it's based on multiple a network of computers and not just on one single server, and that allows you to have a multiple range of not being just shut down for one uh, main person owning it. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. The, the issue of, of being shut down. Yeah, the, uh, the Parler situation was illustrative in that, you know, it, obviously Parler was associated with a specific political identity and mm. there was, you know, the controversy around that. But it, it really should, um, you know, tell everybody here that, you know, if the regulators want you shut down yeah. in whatever jurisdiction, you're getting shut down. So as we talked about, or sorry, as the panel uh, two or three sessions ago said, you know, it's coming this year. So, you know, you might want to get ready for it in, in the sense of making your networks not just participatory, not just compliant, but also robust so that just one single name server doesn't take your system down. Yeah, it's a very important point. Yeah. The floor is yours. <laughs> the floor is mine, okay. So um, I personally think that for our application, we want to allow people to understand all these benefits that you can do, not saying that, you know, web to is not useful, but slowly transform ourselves into thinking of the potentials of Web3 and how it's an excellent use case for us to have a new way of thinking through owning our data. Yeah. And I guess I would um, kind of bookend the conversation by saying that if anybody wants to talk to me about how to set up your networks oh, yeah. so that they are human compliant as well as uh, you know TCP IP compliant uh, I think that that's that, that's an area where where um, you know I'm certainly trying to help your company and I you know certainly help a lot of people out there so I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about it free of charge <laughs> <laughs> same and again um, I previously used to work in the United Nations as a lead data scientist, and we were dealing with big data and doing forecasting predictive modeling for uh, migration patterns. And the importance of data is we can do so much with it. We can see what everyone is doing at all times, uh, see what we need to be doing, make great models, and then essentially optimize our product, live our life with it, so it's very important. So if you want to talk about data and the use case of it, especially in crypto, come and talk to me. And if you're a data scientist also wanting to work with us, that would also be great. Great. Well, I don't have anything else, so. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? No, we're just sort of the, the end of the afternoon crew, so. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I don't think the, I don't think they have any uh, mics for questions. But if anybody else have a question, I'll hand you my mic. Any questions? Oh, what's DeFi Trends? So it's a simplified AI and data-backed crypto intelligence platform that helps retail investors make data-backed investment decisions through on-chain data, so blockchain data, and off-chain data, which is all of the Web2 information that we have 
uh, from social media, from the news, um, so we can see the holistic view of the market at all times, and we're not essentially just relying on one source of information, that being maybe an influencer, but to know everything at all times in one all-inclusive dashboard. And we really, really want to help people enjoy this revolution and come join us in this beautiful revolution because we've been benefiting. And yeah, I'm here also with my co-founders that are uh, also here. But yeah, come talk to us if you want to learn about crypto, make better decision making, and benefit from this. And it's also gamified, so we also have a token, so it's a gamified approach as where you're going through the modules, uh, you're receiving tokens, which is the whole benefit of the Web3, you know, incentivizing usage of our platform, and it's fun, intuitive, and yeah, pretty cool. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, I mean, by definition, uh, I was just talking in the, the back room about how I tried to advise Facebook to not go down a certain path, which I'm sorry, it didn't work. But uh, I was trying to advise them about seven or eight years ago on trying to not be as centralized. But then what happened was what they decided was they were and and public service announcement, they just decided to up their lobbying budget back to the original point. And so I would literally go into a room with a bunch of generals and who would be there but Facebook. Oh, you're here too. So my point would be that, that they decided that centralization was their best friend. The government decided centralization, it was better to have one, they call it one throat to choke, right? Like, you know, the one person that they dealt with. So, so big companies and big governments want to work together. They don't want decentralization. It's, it's a yeah. threat. Yeah, definitely. And so that's why, you know, I'm ideologically in this space as well as, you know, physically, because it, 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 it's an opportunity to democratize things as much as anything else. But so anytime you have like a, a you know, a, um, a dictatorial regime or even a, a giant bureaucratic regime like we have in the US, it's going to be in their best interest to go anti-decentralization. Of course, because then they can shut down whatever they want. They can censor everything right. super easily. And I'm from Turkey, and we see this constantly with Web2. They just go down and say, nope, we're shutting down YouTube for four months because we didn't like some content that it's on. And I think that that's not how it should be. And that's why I'm a firm believer of Web3. This shouldn't be the case. Things should not be censored. Information should be for all, and it should be inclusive. And if you want that information, it should be obtainable. Right, yeah. And at least consistent policies that don't benefit the elites would be good. Yes. Any other questions? He said, what's the purpose yeah. of Singularity DAO? So Singularity DAO, is, as I said, it's, it started out as a sort of all-inclusive DeFi, mm -hmm. bringing DeFi to the people. Uh, you know, there was staking, there's a launch pad for some, uh, other ICOs and, and people that want to work with us. And there's also, um, uh, you know, token bridges and, and, and tools that you'd want to see in a DeFi. So it started out as a DeFi, but the flagship product, which comes out next month, it's already in beta for those of you that are participating in Singularity DAO, you already know that. Mm -hmm. But uh, the 1.0 version will come out in uh, February, and it's basically a crypto hedge fund. The idea is to automate it as much as possible. Uh, the sort of sheepish thing, which is, which is sort of a left-handed plug of, of it, is that we're almost too de decentralized, meaning that, that I come in as the CTO and, the, and one of the architects of the system, and I come in and I look at it, and you know, we're just so heavily reliant on smart contracts. We have all these crazy dependencies. And by the way, if you do build a giant smart contract-based system, I can tell you from experience that uh, make sure you, you get it done a couple weeks before your audit, yeah. because you end up in a situation where the, the complexity and the sort of autonomous nature of the network becomes so uh, hard to manage uh, that you really need to be careful 
And uh, anyway, so Singularity DAO has a, a truly decentralized hedge fund offering coming mm -hmm. out in, uh, in February. And we're in beta, we're already up. I guess, I guess I'm not supposed to talk about uh, <laughs> uh, financial figures, but we're up. So. Yeah, definitely. What about data storage? Are you guys completely decentralized in your storage? No, we're not completely decentralized like in our us, storage. Yeah. I mean, we're 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 hybrid yeah, in the sense like that us. we are. Uh, I've been as C as CTO, I've been pushing a lot of agnosticism, so we can kind of move around the cloud, move around various uh, topologies. So we don't we're not we're not stuck to any central place, whether it's AWS or or whatnot. But uh, it is a hybrid, and yeah. I think that that's. I mean, by definition, if you're just talking, you know, the, the title of this talk was around data and the ramifications thereof. So if you're talking about data, I mean, Jeff Bezos and crew have spent billions optimizing uh, AWS to be, you know, a, a great place to put your data. So, you know, unless you're going to roll your own based on a huge, as you know, yeah. it's expensive to build your own open source stack from, you know, chipset all the way up to use the presentation layer. So ultimately, uh, you know, we, we are hybrid, to, yeah. you know, because lo lowest to total cost of ownership at this point. But yeah, as we move along and as the technology advances, I can see that we will be completely decentralized. That's what we're working for as well. And with networks like the graph, which is a querying service that's completely decentralized, we're, as, as they get better, we're gonna go and move forward into that. But our company as well, we're, we're a hybrid, so I can totally relate with everything that you're saying. But they're really good at AWS, I have to admit. <laughs> they're pretty good. Yeah, well, thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. All right, make some noise.